Changed because people weren't satisfied with these early troponins, and there was a bit of a lag for the less sensitive troponins between onset of symptoms or onset of ischemia and evolving infarction and our positive blood tests. So there was a kind of a demand, both from the, the clinical chemists and, uh, and the clinicians themselves, for a troponin that was visible earlier in the course of the process of infarction. So that led to the development of the high sensitivity troponins. And really the break point in all this is around about 2009 and two uh, very cardinal papers appeared uh, in the New England Journal on the same issue, one from uh, my friends in Basel, uh, Tobias Reichlin and Christian Mueller, and another one uh, which I'll show in a moment. And what they showed is that if you take um, bloods at the time of presentation, and these two receiver operator curves are, are presentation bloods, and you use uh, assays that have better sensitivity uh, than, the, than the standard one, which is represented here or here. So these are everybody at presentation. This is everybody who turned up within three hours of onset of symptoms. And basically you can see that the sensitivity and specificity or the discriminating power is a lot better for the newer, better configured, more sensitive assays than what was then the standard uh, troponin T assay. Uh, you lose some of that if you turn up earlier because clearly there's some evolution in time even for a sensitive assay to show positive. Uh, but overall, it's a very high performance with an area under the curve of about 0.93 plus. Uh, and what you see represented there is the Abbott architect, which is used very frequently, the Roche high sensitivity, uh, so-called high sensitivity assay. Of all the high sensitivity assays now out and about, this is probably the least, so it's kind of the the ancestor high sensitivity assay, if you like. And people define high sensitivity by what proportion of the normal population will show detectable uh, over the limits of detection of the assay. 
and the troponin T, that high sensitivity troponin T from Roche, will detect measurable troponin above its level of detection. That's not the decision limit for MI, that's the limit of detection, in around about 25 to 30% of the population. But the very recent generation high sensitivity TNIs will detect and measure TNI in everybody. So you're now out of the zone of a kind of black, white, yes, no, detectable or not detectable, into having to think carefully about exactly what each level and gradations of level actually mean. And this is the, this is the other uh, cardinal paper that came out about the same time from Keller and colleagues. It's really um, presenting data from the ultra troponin eye, and the lower panels are looking at the, if you like, old-fashioned tests, myoglobin, creatine kinase. It's looking at early um, tests uh, done at admission, which is the red line in each of those graphs, three hours after admission, six hours. You can see that actually by about three hours, you've got almost all the information that you're going to get even by six hours using the troponin eye ultra test. Uh, making people think, well, this is time to start revisiting the time spans involved for keeping people under uh, observation and monitoring. And we got involved in this whole business um, around about that time too, I think 2010 or thereabouts. And this is a, a paper that's come out just last year from our collaborative groups, um, Australia and New Zealand, and what we did was compare two high sensitivity tests, uh, the Roche HS TNT, which is kind of like the first HS test, and uh, 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 a, um, a TNI, the um, Abbott TNI test. So we used um, uh, information from 1,976 patients presenting to the ED apparently in need of assessment for possible acute coronary syndromes. And some of those dropped out because we didn't have data or we didn't get the blood or something else was uh, inappropriate. We ended up with 1571 cases, and of those, 204 actually did have a final adjudicated diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction. So fairly typical proportions from a chest pain population. And we compared high sensitivity to troponin T uh, with high sensitivity to troponin I, and you can see they both have really good areas under the curve. Actually, the TNI is a bit better than the TNT, and that was statistically significant, but in terms of clinical difference, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. So this all sounds great, and you've got this kind of figure here from that data set saying you've got 95.6 sensitivity, 93.1 specificity, and very good negative predictive value. You've got a negative likelihood ratio on that bottom line there, uh, which is vanishingly small. So this sounds like almost a perfect test. So well, what's the problem? There is a problem. And the problem sort of became apparent with this kind of conversation going on in the literature. So might help in reality is a suggestion that there's a bit of an issue. Alan Jaffe and Fred Apple are both kind of clinical chemistry gurus who love to dabble in, in uh, cardiology. I mean, Alan actually is a cardiologist. I should be kind of amazing. This is um, high sensitivity troponin assays. Where is it going? Cartus, so the father of troponins himself, is suggesting that there may be questions about how to apply all this. Is it friend or foe? Even more suspicious of, of troubles from my friends in Basel. And then um, on the relative value of an assay versus that of a test, what's, what's going on? What's the difference between an assay and a test? Aren't they the same thing? Well, this is a famous quote now from this guy, Robert Jesse. He'll be remembered more for this quote than anything else he's ever done this time. Every talk about the high sensitivity troponins that ever gets given comes up with this neat little phrase. When troponin was a lousy assay, it was a great test. Now that it's a great assay, it's getting to be a lousy test. What does he mean? We've just shown you how brilliantly it performs. Well, the problem is this, and I'm sure everybody in this room really knows this really well, and all the cardiologists around the world know it really well too. The problem is you get a lot of positive tests, and the vast majority of them are not acute coronary syndromes. So 69% of elevations. In this case, this is again from Heidelberg. I, I, did the, I took it from Heidelberg because data like this appears from all around the world. I use Heidelberg because it's from Cartos, who uh, introduced Japan into the world of ACS in the first place. And he moved from uh, Lübeck to Heidelberg, and that's where he's based now. So 20% of patients that were admitted to the chest pain unit in this case, so this is not quite the ED, it's one step further along. They did have positive... Um, uh, troponins. In other words, they had a reading on the HST and T from Roche of greater than 14 picograms per milliliter. But of those people, more than two thirds actually didn't, in the end of the day, have an acute coronary syndrome. They had 
HST and G positive non ACS. <clears throat> and that is the way, that's a phenomenon that's being found everywhere. And it's because uh, troponin from the acute MI looks just the same as troponin from a lot of other things myocarditis, tachycardia, acute heart failure, chronic heart failure, in the case of the older TNTs, uh, renal disease. And this has produced a whole new epidemic, particularly in ED departments called troponinitis. And it usually takes the form, one of the major symptoms is a referral that says, uh, admitted with uh, equivocal chest pains, ECG, non-specific changes, elevated troponin, please advise. And that's what, uh, that's what cardiology spends a lot of its time doing now. So, what is the solution to this? The solution is actually you have to go back to the old-fashioned approach that we had when we had less um, black and white tests to work with and apply the usual clinical algorithm. It actually is no magic. But there are some really obvious things that you can apply which will give you a lot of relief from this particular um, deluge of uh, uncertainty. And the first is having a good idea about what the differential diagnosis of a raised troponin uh, might be. And there are a lot of these. I mean, this, this paper came out uh, now seven years ago. So even then, we knew pretty well that troponins can be up for a lot of reasons other than having an acute myocardial infarction. Congestive heart failure, both acute and chronic, tachy or bradyarrhythmias, um, apical ballooning syndrome, taco subo, uh, pulmonary embolism, kidney failure, particularly the TNTs, uh, myocarditis, people that are critically ill with multi-system problems or multi-trauma or sepsis, they can all have troponins that um, cross that decision limit. So basically you have to look at the patient and put them in context, have a proper history and a proper assessment, and that will help a lot of the time. And these data date from around about 2006 onwards or so. They suggest that uh, supraventricular tachycardias, acute heart failure, hemodialysis, critically ill patients, stroke patients, all will have, 20% or more of those groups on acute presentation, will have TNTs. This is all really based around the HSTNT test. They'll have elevated values. And of course, for some of the other tests, it may be slightly greater or lesser percentages. But you'll get a lot of other disease, both cardiac and non-cardiac, that has elevated components. <coughs> so know your differential diagnosis. It's as simple as that. There's no easy way. You have to go away and read around it, gather your experience together, and carry a differential diagnosis in your head uh, when you see these tests that uh, pop up in the ED department. What about the... Uh, uh, so cardiac troponin T over the 99th percentile using a high-sensitivity troponin. This is, once again, the Roche test. Stable coronary disease, even some of those walking around with no symptoms but known to have coronary disease will have an elevation. Pulmonary embolism pretty high. Just being old, it's not going to have you over the decision limit quite a lot of the time, about half the time. So there are issues. And we don't quite know what acute heart failure and these other things might do for the new generation, late generation, high sensitivity test. But we can be pretty sure that high numbers amongst hypertensive people, AFib uh, and so forth, will have elevated values. So once it, I mean, basically it boils down to having a differential diagnosis, keeping it in mind, testing for it quickly. So you use all the available information that you've got. You've got to have your history, your examination, your ECG, all sorted out in your head, and basic biochemistry, particularly creatinines and uh, hematology. It's a simple stuff that we do all the time, but you have to apply it to that troponin result and ask yourself, does this all hang together? Does it look like an ACS or does it look like something else? And these things on this slide really just reiterate what I've just said. Is the complaint right? Are the symptoms fit? Is it actually the right timing? You know, have they stopped having pain more than 12 hours ago? In which case, a um, very modestly elevated troponin might mean something might mean something different. What's the ECG look like? Very often, ECGs have non-specific changes, or they're normal. Renal function should be okay. Have they? What's their past history? Have they had an MI? The best predictor of having an MI is having had one in the past. Um, and so forth. These are all things that I think every generally trained resident and certainly every uh, experienced ED doc applies all the time. And you need to remember at the back of your head that the positive predictive value of a positive result in the ED, an acute presentation, is no better than uh, uh, 50% with these high sensitivity tests. So only half the people at best, and possibly less judging by that high degree of data, are going to end up with that label of QDMI at the end of your end of this process. 
use numbers rather than yes nos. So it's no longer black white, and you have to have an idea about what that number is. So for HST and T, it's 14 picograms per mil is the 99th percentile, and you need to have that number in your head if you're using another HS test. The T and I's, I think, are going to be taking over a bit from the high sensitivity T and T's because I think they are a little bit better. Uh, I think they get marketed a bit more aggressively as well. So it's quite likely that a lot of centres will be having HST and I's, and they need to figure out. Uh, they need to know what their 99 percentile is and know what the different values are, uh, amount to. So add admission over the 99 percentile. Then you come through the door. If you got, actually do have an acute MI, then 94 percent of you will be over that magic 14 picograms per mil mark. But you know, unstable angina at, at the end of adjudication. 47% of cardiac pain that's not ACS or cardiac symptoms, 15% of non-cardiac presentations. People who come in with symptoms and you end up with unknowing. And we all know that a lot of people leave hospital with chest pain diagnosis not obtained. Um, a third of those people will have an elevated level when they come through the door. So it's not yes, no, and it's uh, influenced by, uh, you have to base your consideration on what the actual number you're looking at is and the actual assay you're dealing with and become very familiar with your local assay, your local high sensitivity assay. That positive predictive value depends on the timing of the test as well. So if you come through the door with a value between 14 and 49 picograms per mil down here on admission, actually only 15% of you are going to end up with a final diagnosis of AMI. If you come through the door with a value at 200 picograms per mil, that's what that translates to, then the vast majority of you will be actually having an acute MI. So you need to have that kind of thought in your mind. Low positive doesn't mean the same thing in terms of prediction as a high positive. Uh, and you need to have a kind of a, a step ladder in your head. So there's that magic 014, which is 14 picograms per mil. And climbing on above and above and above that, you get more and more and more certain uh, with early uh, admin, uh, admission levels, baseline levels. What about change? Well, a lot of debates going on about whether absolute or percentage change is better, and I'll tell you now that it is absolute change that you want to pay attention to. So this graph shows uh, HST and T and HST and I side by side. The blue and the green are T and T, the red and the purple are T and I's. And you can see that in a QDMI, changes over one to two hours uh, are pretty obvious if you're having an acute MI. Changes over one to two hours in absolute terms if you've got unstable angina, cardiac problems but not coronary, uh, acute coronary syndrome, non-cardiac pain or unknown diagnosis, these changes on average are tiny. So this is actually quite a good way of discriminating if you've got that observation of a shift from baseline to one hour or to two hours and it's looking like this, they are much more likely to be having an AMI than to be having one of these other conditions. If you look for percentage change, the problem with percentage change is that you know, 100% change from, from almost nothing is still almost nothing. So it doesn't mean a lot. It's the wobble of the test. And you can see that the discrimination here from here is a lot less than the discrimination here from here. So use absolute changes as you go. What absolute change should you use? No one knows. If you look at the guidelines, they won't tell you. <laughs> but actually, quite small changes are probably enough. If you get a change from zero to two to three hours in the vicinity of even three to four picograms per mil, that is important. That should be taken as, as a positive uh, change. And this is just a rocks of absolute versus percentage change, making the same point that absolute changes work better. And we did the same thing, we looked at uh, change over time, we found that we just started by saying if you have a 99th percentile result over a, a positive when they come through the door, either at zero or two hours, then this is how it performs, you get 95% sensitivity, 80% specificity. But if you then demand a 10% shift within that two hours, you gain specificity, it goes from 80 to 90%, but you lose sensitivity, it drops down from 95 down to below 70%. And it's not until you get right up at asking for an 84% increment over your 0 to 1 to 2 hours that you regain the sensitivity you started with. So I think, once again, don't use percentage changes. Use uh, uh, small absolute changes to help influence your decision. Working people up uh, is going to be important in a subgroup. This is the data from Mills from the Edinburgh, from the UK. And it shows that when they were uh, reworking their Japan and I test, uh, they used high thresholds, so this is a little bit out of date, but they looked at these grades of positivity, and their, their decision limit at that stage was 200 nanograms per mil for a TNI, which is pretty high. They rejigged the test uh, and changed to 50 nanograms per mil, and they looked at what happened to 1,000 patients before they did that and 1,000 patients after they did that, 
And what they found was that people that sat in the mid-zone, 50 to uh, 190, who were considered to be below the decision limit and therefore not MIs, actually did pretty well because they did poorly. They did the, the worst of the survival lines. That's this group here. Once the test was rejigged and the decision limit was changed, the whole approach to that mid-group was changed and their prognosis changed as well. So it really makes a difference where you put that decision limit. We now know that they were shooting too high. They probably ought to be shooting for this test at around about 35 picograms per mil. And if you do that, you suddenly get down to almost total 100% negative predicted values. You can set up algorithms. This is one from Basel. There are hundreds of these around. But they all are based on quite good sample sizes, you know, 800,000 over. They can all be done in your own hospitals if you just take time to pull the, the postage stamps together and add them all up and do the analysis after a year. So this just shows that you can pick limits and a little bit adjusted according to age. And on that left-hand column, if you're below those performances at baseline, and at one hour, so these are things that you can find out within one hour of arrival. Um, that you can rule out uh, with 100% sensitivity and 100% negative predictive value in two-thirds of your patients with presence in acute MI. On the right-hand side with the red boxes, you've got high, very high likelihood that yes, they do have an MI, you should treat them that way. In between, you have to put your thinking cap on and do some extra work. And that does apply to 21% uh, uh, of your population. Uh, I won't dwell too much on that because I, I think I'm almost out of time. I just want to give one last final kind of... Um, set of ideas, which is about not so much focusing upon ruling people in, but upon finding who's safe so you can rule them out and send them home. And we've done quite a little bit of this. Uh, we've published uh, two or three times um, with uh, an Asian uh, a PAC um, set of collaborators in the Lancet of World Bank, with Australia and Christchurch, and also with Australia, Christchurch and Basel publishing together. But this is a typical result. So we use this uh, accelerated diagnostic protocol, which is just a combination of ECG, TIMI score, and the presence or absence of a positive troponin defined by the decision limit for that particular late generation troponin. You don't even have to use a high sensitivity so-called troponin to get this kind of result. We use these two assays, Abbott Architect in Christchurch, and the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital use a, a Beckman Colter assay, uh, a TNI. Uh, so we didn't even have to use the same assay to get this result across two centres, you know, separated by 1,500 miles of ocean. And we recruited uh, over 2,000 people after we'd done all the knockouts and exclusions down to 1975. And what we found is, uh, shown in this square here essentially, that if you didn't have an abnormal ECG on presentation, if your troponin didn't exceed the decision limit for that particular assay, and you didn't have, you had only zero on your TIMI score, then you constituted about 15 to 20% of the population, and you had almost no chance of suffering a major adverse cardiac event in the next 30 days. It was one. It was a rate of 0.26%, um, which is, you know, useful discrimination. And you can break this down as we're looking at ECG by itself, troponin by itself, TIMI score by itself, ECG added with troponin, ECG added with TIMI, or putting the whole lot together to give you the accelerated diagnostic protocol. And what you find, the MACE rates with negative tests, so if your ECG is negative, then 13% of those people still get MACE in 30 days. If your troponin is negative, 2.4% of those get MACE in 30 days. This is tests taken within zero to two hours of coming through the door, not at three hours plus. TIMI score zero, 2% of those people have an event. ECG negative, TIMI zero, 1.3. ECG and troponin both negative, 2.3. But if you have the ADP, if you put three of these simple things together, and they're all clear, then it's 1 in 400. It's very, very unlikely that you're going to have an event. Low risk. So what we did was turn that into an RCT, because everything you've seen up to date in the talk has been observational, but you can run an RCT. This was a pragmatic trial. We gave people the accelerated diagnostic protocol and said, use this, or use your usual approach. And actually, you can make your own choice whether you do one or the other, uh, because it's pragmatic. So you're also testing the acceptability of the ADP to ED docs. And what we did, so this is the same excellent ADP that I already described. We randomised 500 people because that's the power that was required. What we found at the end of the day is that you could get people out of hospital in, in less than six hours, about 20% of cases if you use the accelerated protocol, and as compared to 11% uh, of cases, so about double the rate. What we also found is that people didn't believe us necessarily, and they didn't always apply uh, the accelerated diagnostic protocol. And, in the end, we found that uh, 52 low-risk patients were discharged, but actually there were another 35 that qualified as low-risk on the ADP, but they were admitted because basically people were being cautious. That's another 12.9%.
and these 12.9% all at the end of the day had an adjudicated absence of acute coronary syndrome and nothing happened to them in 30 days. So potentially we could have actually sent home almost a third of people if we just believed the ADP. Nevertheless, enough people believed it enough of the time to, to double our early discharge rates. And we think that's an easily applied approach that can be put across any hospital anywhere because you're not asking much. You're not asking for new facilities. You're not asking for a test that you're not already using. So in conclusion, uh, TN, high sensitivity TNs do push up the number of final diagnoses of AMI by about 20%, but they push up a lot of other non-cardiac diagnoses, and then you have to apply this kind of intelligent surf of how to make sense of it and make sure you're ruling people in and ruling people out appropriately. That simple algorithms can be better ruled, like those, that three-part chart I showed you from Switzerland, and simple algorithms can define low-risk groups. And the bits in the middle, you have to think more carefully, which is always the way it is with me. I'll conclude at that point. Thank you very much.